the LGBTQ movement uh, was was very different. It was really emerging from shadows. In it was our country. emerging, and it was very much a separatist community at that time. We weren't mm. yet, you know, through the AIDS crisis where lesbians and men really did come together out of necessity, mm -hmm. and we were taking care of the guys who were dying, and we were mm. getting their medicine and going to act up and laying down and get arrested on the streets. You know that yep. th that. That horrible time for all gay people, when, you know, your whole world, all of your friends are dying, unified the gay community in a way that I think spawned this new generation of, but it's my children, even my 10-year-old who corrects me on these things. <laughs> That's right. And it's so embarrassing and it's so <laughs> shaming that I'm this lesbian, big star, <laughs> icon, gay something. She told me that her stuffed animals were non-binary. <laughs> I'm like, here we go. Here we go. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? She goes, they don't feel like a boy and they don't feel like a girl. I said, well, that's fantastic. Do you know what's funny is that I'm a girl who people used to call a tomboy because I liked all the boy stuff when I was little. And you know what's weird? Mm. I still do really like the boy stuff. I like football. I like riding a motorcycle. I like to do a lot of stuff that boys traditionally like to do. But you know what else? Never was confused about thinking if I was a boy <laughs> or a girl. Always knew I was a girl and loved being a girl. So you can be a girl and feel any way you want or you can figure out what it, what it is. And I'm like rambling and rambling. And she said, are you done? <laughs> It's my and Bialik's breakdown She's gonna break it down for you Because you know she knows a thing or two And now she's gonna break down It's a breakdown She's gonna break it down Hi, I'm Maya Bialik and welcome to my breakdown This is the place where we break things down So that you don't break down I'm here without Jonathan today It's a solo episode Sorry to miss him, but I'm sure he'll be listening right along with you And actually he probably will be editing the episode So he will, uh he will be part of it no matter what. Um, we've got a really exciting guest today. We have Rosie O'Donnell on today. And I learned so many things about Rosie O'Donnell. She went by Roe her whole life. <laughs> That's really funny. I assumed she was just Rosie. Nope. She's a Roseanne who went by Roe. And, you know, many of you may have kind of touch points of Rosie O'Donnell and where she fits into um, into television and comedy history, um, you know, in the early 80s, she was on Star Search as a comedian and, you know, went on to have this incredible career. She was in A League of Their Own, which many of you may have seen, but she's incredibly public as a mother, um, a mother of children who she has adopted and in some cases fostered. And she's a, an advocate um, for so many different kinds of of rights. Um, but she speaks very intimately with us about the challenges that she's had as a mother, uh, the the challenges that she's had dealing with all sorts of trauma kind of around her. But she has this really incredible, incredible positivity about her. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say. It's really just a pleasure to welcome Rosie O'Donnell to the breakdown. Break it down. Hi. So nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. It's the glasses, no makeup party. Well, you know, I looked at these like, you know, over 61 year old <laughs> zits that I have like a teenager. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I really should have a little go to kit to like cover them up for podcasts. I think you look perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, this is really, really fun. Um, I'm very excited to get to speak to you. I've been a longtime fan of yours. I believe I watched you on Star Search. Like, that's how long I have been a fan of yours. Wow. You were young. I was <laughs> not as young as you'd think, but yes, I was young. Um, but it's really, it's um, really fun to talk to you. Y you have a podcast as well. Just started. Just started. It's called, you just started. Congratulations. It's called Onward. Yeah. And it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. What is it? What's the journey for you been like having a podcast? How do you like it? Well, I really love what it does for me as far as being a mom in my home life, you know, because I have a <clears throat> 10 year old daughter, the youngest of five. And at 50 years old, I adopted her. 
And, uh, you know, I am now the 61-year-old mother of a fourth grader. <laughs> so I'm the definitely oldest one at the parties there when we go. And, um, you know, she's on the spectrum. She's really brilliant. Mm-hmm. She's so um, enchantingly, creatively magical to me that I feel like I want to spend all my time with her. And in many ways, it's it's needed... Uh, in a way that it wasn't with my other four. Although my other mm. four had their own, you know, little challenges to actually get a diagnosis of autism and then mm. trying to figure out how you can take this journey that you're on together in the most, you know, adventurous and and um, authentic way. And mm-hmm. I, I feel so lucky that I get to have almost an only child after having a try before <laughs> and that it gets to be this experience, you know. And we'll get to all of those things. But I think also that's one of the really neat things about the podcast world. You literally can do that yes. just as you are wherever you are. Um my mom actually just texted me today because our season, our season three of Call Me Cat wrapped. And my mom's like, what are you actually doing these days? <laughs> I said, well, mom, uh, I've got four jobs. podcasting. You have a lot right, of jobs. No, but us, no, but honestly, like, you know, podcasting, um, it is, it's that thing that, um, I don't want to say it's easy because there's parts of it that are really challenging and I'm sure you've had, you know, moments as well. And for us and what we do here, um, it's emotionally, you know, kind of like being wrung out uh, many episodes that we do. But it is really nice to be able to do it um, and then be able to, you know, go make dinner for my kids. Exactly. And be be home at a reasonable hour when I'm, you know, podcasting close by. So um, and I feel it's like a joy to me because <clears throat> my four kids who are now, you know, 20 to 27, the first four, the original mm-hmm. Beatles, uh, they <laughs> they uh, really functioned as a unit because we mm-hmm. had to, because there was four in a row, right? And right. with this baby, even though she's not a baby anymore, uh, she's 10, <laughs> and my therapist says, can we stop this already? Could you, you're not Mama Rose. Can you stop calling her baby? <laughs> but sing out, Louise. Uh so anyway, I, I have found it really exciting. Now, the bad part about the podcast for me is that when I was first asked to do them, I wasn't really a consumer of them. Mm-hmm. I only listened to um, Pod Save America during the Trump administration, and that was sort of it. <laughs> That's, yes. That was as it much. It served a specific purpose. Yes, and I really needed some information from some very smart, connected guys, and they gave it to me every day, and I felt a little bit calmer during that time. And um, aside from that, you know, I had heard Joe Rogan's podcast, I, mm-hmm. but I wasn't a consumer by any means. I, I didn't know the art form. I knew radio from listening to Howard sure. Stern for all those years. I obviously knew, knew TV when I did it, but this was like, I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I had to figure it out as I went and as I consumed more and learned right. more. And then I got so excited at the possibilities. Oh, well, it's I mean, also, it it feels like a really natural thing. If if, you know, if you don't mind me saying like you are you are incredibly well spoken, incredibly funny, very thoughtful and have a really a a super diverse kind of work and life experience to draw on. So for me, I I feel like it's um, it just seems really, really like a great fit. And I hope that it continues to be so for you. but I, I have a, a real fascination with you as a person. And um, I wonder if you can kind of talk us a little bit through um, your your childhood. Your dad was Irish, like from Ireland, yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, and your mom was Irish-American, right. which uh, is also Irish. Um, but tell us a little bit about growing up. You're from Long Island. I'm from Long Island. And I was watching Conan recently on Jimmy Fallon or something, and he was saying that he did... 23 and me and he came back 100% Irish. That's what I did too. I did my 23 and me to see if I could be, you know, a little bit Jewish because I always feel like that was my, you know, calling inside. What you don't have enough suffering? But, you well, wanted our suffering I like the too. suffering of the Jews a little better than the suffering of the Catholics. You get a lot of better food. There was like a nicer houses in my opinion where I grew That's up. Right. It was less less alcohol, more depression is usually what we say. But more love too. You know, I went into Lisa Shackner's house in fifth grade and mm. uh, Lori Shackner, the girl, and I was like, 
this is where I want to end up in my life. I mm. want to have leather couches and shag rugs. <laughs> I want to have everyone together at dinner. I want kisses on both cheeks. Hello <laughs> and good night. I want the home mishpukai thing, you know. <laughs> but I'm 100% Irish. And I grew up in a, you know, typical suburban Long Island family where all the houses were new. And mm. um, they killed the potato fields in the 60s. And then they built these mm. houses and we all moved in. Every house had at least three children. There were like 20 <laughs> houses on our block. A lot of the women, a lot of the mothers ended up getting breast cancer like my mother did and dying. M my grandmother, they moved to Long Island in the early 50s and she also had breast cancer very young. Yeah. And back then they did a radical mastectomy. Um, but she yeah, survived. She, was she one survived. Of those, she did, yes. Wow. Because my mom, what they told me, <clears throat> Only years later, because um, mm -hmm. we didn't know uh, particularly that it was breast cancer. Like, nobody talked about it. Right. We didn't talk about it. Yeah, it was completely a mystery. And I remember being in the eighth grade, and I was with uh, Jackie, my best friend, and her father. They were divorced, and so some weekends we would go to her father's apartment, and there was a bike-a-thon for cancer. And he looked at me and he said, you know, mm -hmm. Roseanne, uh, if enough people do things like this, your mom and my dad won't have to die of cancer. And that's how I found oh. out three years later that that's what she had died of. But uh, my dad was, you know, traditional Irish Catholic, and my mom was too. She was the head of the parish council. She was, you know, very involved in the church. She would get scolded by the priest, you know, don't rock the boat, Roseanne. I remember she came home once from mm. the church thing crying that he had told her not to rock the boat. And um, I remember telling her once, when I was about to get my communion right when she was sick, I said, Mom, what do you think? Maybe I'm going to be a nun. And she said, oh, promise me you're not. It doesn't pay very mm. well. <laughs> <laughs> so she was doing jokes even then, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was a family that had a lot of alcoholism. My father's mm -hmm. one of uh, 10 kids, and there were a lot of tragic deaths and early deaths and, mm -hmm. and alcoholism. There was a lot of abuse in his family. You know, his father was run out of Ireland for interfering with the local children. Wow. And uh, never met that guy, actually, my father's father. But that's what he grew up with and was surrounded mm -hmm. by. And it's not as though, you know, men who were my father's age, he's, he died a few years ago in his 80s. And um, mm. it's not as though they were running to therapy. <laughs> you know, it's not like anybody no. said in 73, your wife has died. You got some issues. You uh, you need some help, Ed. You know, <laughs> that wasn't really mm -hmm. on the table. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, present. He had many um, lasting effects of the ramifications of his child abuse. Mm -hmm. And um, when I talk about it, you know, I always feel like I'm a timeshare owner of a condo with my four other siblings. And sometimes, mm. you know, when one person is famous and feels comfortable <laughs> discussing things that they went through, it doesn't always sit well with the other members. They don't like no, it. No, not so much, you know. So I always yeah. try to gingerly walk yeah. on shared territory. But um, gosh, we could talk forever about that. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I Anyway, okay, we'll, we'll set that aside for now. But so, uh, what number are you? Three. In the, uh, in the, you're, oh, you're right in the middle. Yeah, first girl. Wow. So, my oldest oh, brother, so... Eddie, is named after my dad, and I'm named after mm -hmm. my mother. So, when the phone rang, oh. it would be like, Big Roseanne or Little Roseanne's? Oh. Big Ed or Small Ed, you know? <laughs> so, I remember thinking, I'm not going to do that to my children. I'm not going to name them after me. Um, and so, um, how old were you all when your mother passed? I was 10. It was 1973. And my bro oldest brother was 12. And that's oh. Eddie. And then Danny was 10, was 11. Then I was 10. Maureen was nine. And Timmy was five. Wow. Yeah. And <clears throat> from my memory, and, you know, everybody has their own. And, and sometimes we argue for whose is, is closest to true. But um, mm -hmm. she got sick around Thanksgiving in 1972. And then she died on St. Patrick's Day, oh. which was March, a few months later. And I remember thinking nothing can bad, bad could happen today because it's St. Patrick's Day. Oh. You know, because when you're little and your mother's in the hospital dying and there's chaos everywhere. I, I don't remember sure. taking a shower every day, but I remember that day I took a shower 
And I looked in the mirror and I said, it's got to be a lucky day because we're all Irish. Mm. And then that's the day that she died. So, um, I mean, I think you, you make a really, you know, a really succinct point to say that, you know, men of that generation and, you know, we can pile on the 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 adjectives around it, you know, yes. uh, men of that generation, uh, engineers of that generation, yes. whatever it was, um, you know, this was something to, to move on from, I, I'm imagining. But, you know, for, for all of y'all, that is... Um, those are those are little kids, you know. Those are babies. Yes. You were all really still babies. Um, who who kind of raised you from then on, especially with you as the oldest girl? Because, n- n- you know, not to make it a gendered issue, but oftentimes in families, if there's an older sister, yeah, you know, she will automatically, especially in in Irish families and ethnic families, she'll be kind of the one to slide in and take care of things. You were the oldest girl, yeah, but, but still, still a child yourself. What was it like? You know. Before she died, she taught each one of us to cook one meal. Mm. Okay, so we're like learning this in the God. kitchen while she's still healthy enough to stand up. But we're thinking in our heads, why is she doing this? I'm not going to be cooking. Like, you don't go near the oh. stove. You get in trouble if you're that years, you know, eight years old, 10 years old. And um, so she taught us each how to cook something, which, you know, felt very unfair to me because after she died, then we each had a night. So, you know, mm. Maureen would make the spaghetti with the ragu. And I would make the, uh, you know, steak with the Seven Seas Italian dressing as the marinade. <laughs> and, like, this is what she taught us each, you know. And it, it became uh, such a daily, nightly memory of what was missing. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It was like, well, now we're on our own. What do we do? Sometimes somebody would be setting the plates and you'd set the extra plate for mommy. Oh, and God. nobody would say anything because you don't really talk about it. And. You know, it was, it was tough. I got to say, it was very, very tough. And my mother's mother, Nana, lived with us and Mm -hmm. um, always had, but she wasn't really a functional Nana. Like she didn't drive a car. She didn't go outside very much. (laughs) She couldn't see who was who. She'd call me Danny, Maureen, Timmy, come here, Ed, who's that, you know? (laughs) And, um, but the fact that she was there and she was present made us, Mm -hmm at least have someone to come home to after school Mm because, you know, my father had to continue to work, of course. And and we were five kids trying to trying to get ourselves through school and and the shock of having, you know, a mom disappear. And then no one mentioned it, you know. Mind the Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. You know, every week I try to balance my time effectively between commitments at work and then my commitments as a mom and to all the other people in my life. But I also try and take time for myself, but I don't always excel at that. It's very easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs and not take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. But what I have discovered is that when we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so that you can support others but not leave yourself behind. This is one of the things that I love focusing on in therapy and it's therapy's the gift that keeps on giving because things opportunities always come up for me to not put myself first and that's what I use therapy for to keep reminding myself that that's still critically important. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even your time. Squarespace makes it easy for creators and educators to monetize their content and expertise in a way that fits their brand. So there's these member areas. You can unlock a new revenue stream for your business, free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, or newsletters. Stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns. You can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. You start with an email template. You can customize it by applying your brand ingredients like your site colors and your logo. Built-in analytics will help you measure the impact of every cent. Also, support your cause by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. 
Also, you can gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your content with in-depth website analytics tools like page views, traffic sources, time on site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. Also, Squarespace has really powerful blogging tools. You can share stories, photos, videos, and updates, categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. You can also display posts from your social media profiles on your website and automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that your followers can share it too. Go to squarespace.com slash breakdown for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code breakdown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Not to reduce you to the things that you achieved in high school, but given all that, you had a pretty interesting set of four things. You were homecoming queen, yes. prom queen, mm -hmm. senior class president, and also class clown. <laughs> there you go. Is that so the recipe who, for success, Mayim, do you think? I mean, if, if, if it's not, I don't know what is. <laughs> so... Uh, by then, were you going by Rosie? No. Instead of Roseanne? No. Oh. Everyone call me. Wow. Everyone who knows me from my real life calls me Ro. But when I okay. was uh, doing stand up at 16, this comedy club owner named Richard M. Dixon, he changed his name because he looked. His name was Dick Dixon? Because he looked like Nixon. So he changed his name <laughs> legally to Richard M. Dixon. And he owned a comedy club called The White House, Dick Dixon's White House. And I performed there one night, and he's like, Ro O'Donnell doesn't make any sense. From now on, kid, you're Rosie. You're Rosie wow. O'Donnell. And, and that's the only time that anyone ever called me that in my life. So I really do associate it very much with show business and mm. never really with me, you know? Uh, okay, so tell us who Ro was besides Homecoming Queen. Like, what, what were you like then? I was so interested in the attention of the teachers. I wanted the respect and the love of the teachers. I wanted adults mm -hmm. to know me, to care about me, to love me. And I was very lucky because a year after my mother died, I went to junior high because I was in fifth grade when she died. I did sixth grade and then I went over to the junior high school and there was a brand new teacher named Pat Maribel in public school. And the third day of seventh grade, he asked where my mother was, that he wanted to call my mother because I didn't do the homework and I panicked. Mm. And the other kids in the class, a lot of them knew because they were from the school that I had been in. Mm -hmm. And they were writing each other notes. And then I saw one note that they passed that said, Roseanne's mother is dead. And I like was like, that was the first time I sort of heard it put that way. So I ran mm. out of the school and it was like a big thing. I hid in the woods for a couple of hours. Mm. And then I tried to get into my house, but my grandmother was in the hospital at the time. So I went and broke in the neighbor's house and I went into their basement and mm. hid there. And then I didn't go to school for two weeks. And, you know, uh, there was a lot of trauma and a lot of kind of toughness. Like I, I kind of was like a little bit of a tough girl who wasn't going to let anyone love me, yet it's all I wanted, you know? Mm. All I wanted was, like, yearning to have... The, and this teacher did it. She read the case and said, let me have that girl in my class as a helper, eighth period. Oh. And she was the first woman, my um, first person to tell me she loved me. Oh, she was the God. first person to give me a hug. She was mm. uh, the first person who let me know that love makes a family, not blood. And mm -hmm. she had two children, and I'm the godparents of those children, and they have children mm -hmm. now. And she has, has passed away also of breast cancer, which is weird. But she definitely mothered me from the time I was 13 years old mm. all the way up until, until she died. So, you know, I was, I was a good student because I wanted them to love me. I was so, uh, so eager to be seen as good by them. And I have to tell mm -hmm. you, these public school teachers, were astounding because we had my grandmother who was not really able to care for herself. So we had to go home and feed her for lunch every day. And, mm -hmm. and um, the teachers all knew we would come in later in the morning, we would be late because we were getting Nana ready or whatever. And so all the teachers kind of knew about this family. And when my mm -hmm. grandmother died a year after um, I graduated high school, I came back from college and they all showed up at the wake. Mm -hmm. All the public school teachers for this little family that 
you know, and I was one of those kids that benefited from all that love, from all those teachers, mm -hmm. from all the neighbors. Jackie, who is still my best friend, 58 mm -hmm. years now, I apparently knocked on her door when I was three and said to her mother, do you have <laughs> anyone here who's three? <laughs> her mother said, yes, I do. And that was that, you know. <laughs> and so she was just here. We did Family Feud, Mayim. Oh, wow. That was fun. That was fun. And, uh, you know, so I still have the that same group around me. I have my best friends. Jackie and Jeannie are still my best friends. And, you know, I'm very close to my family. And I don't know. I like the whole mishpoki thing, you know? I want to know a little bit more about kind of your personality. You have such a distinctive personality. And as, as a comic... You had such a specific and distinctive personality, really the arc of your career. I mean, you're, there's there's really there's not anybody like you. And I'm wondering, as a teenager, um, how how was it that you got into comedy, especially so young? Well, you know, in my high school, there was a thing called Senior Follies, where the senior mm -hmm. class makes fun of the of the teachers and everything their last year and sing parody songs and. So my brother, Eddie, was a senior when I was a freshman. And they said, I gave him some skits that I had taken from Saturday Night Live's album. Wow. And I changed the words. So, you know, <laughs> we had a teacher who was very flat called Mrs. Barron. She was skinny as can be, like a string bean. And so we took right from SNL, Weekend Update, Mrs. Barron. More on that story as it develops. You know, so I... <laughs> I would just take what I had heard on all these comedy records, especially Saturday Night Live, and I rewrote it for the teachers. And so then I was writing this Senior Follies for all the years that I was in high school. Wow. And this comedian named Richie Minervini, whose little brother was in my class, but he was about 10 years older. He was 28 or 29. He came over to me and said, you wrote that? I go, well, kind of. I took it from the records. And he said, um, why don't you try to be a comedian? I'm like, nope, I'm going to be on Broadway. I'm going to be um, mm. on Broadway or a backup singer for Bette Midler. I'm going to. And he's like, well, why don't you just come and try it? And I went and tried it. And it was very funny because everybody from my high school was there. But the next night, mm. Mayim, it was a school night and nobody was there. And I died a horrible death. So it was like <laughs> the best thing that could have happened to me on a Thursday and the worst thing that could have happened to me on a Friday. But um, and then I started doing it. I was 16 years old. And I just was up there and he let me, Richie let me go on whenever I wanted to. And and then I was really lucky because, you know, Shirley Hemphill from that show, What's Happening? Yes, you remember of course. Her? She, Cheryl. She, exactly. <laughs> she came to be the headliner and it was a big deal in Comac, right? And she saw me at the open mic night. She came in a night early and was sitting in the club having dinner. And she goes over to Richie and says, who's that little one? And Richie goes, oh, she's in high school. She's just starting. She's, she's working for me this weekend. And Shirley Hempel got me paid $50 for each show. <laughs> I made $250 in the weekend. I was 16. That felt like being a right. millionaire, you know. Right. And, and so it began my career of, of working and making money because of Shirley Hempel. That is incredible. Um, so Star Search, for, for people who don't know, was like the greatest show on television. It was. And it was, like, it, it was, it was an unbelievable, you, you know, I think now people are so used to like American Idol and America's Got Talent and all these things. But back then it was, I mean, for me as a kid, it was my window really into the country yes, because totally. you saw people that you'd never get to see doing you know, having talent that just you would only dream of. And, you know, the comedians, I mean, some incredible and very famous people came from from Star Search, you you being one of them. Um, but you moved to Los Angeles with the prize money that you won. Yes. Correct? Yes. From Star Search. I won like twenty six thousand dollars or something because you got wow. to, you got like eighteen hundred every time you won. And then you got money for the one you lost. And then, so by mm -hmm. the time I was done with my run there, I had $26,000 and I moved wow. to LA. I got a rented, uh, I rented a furnished studio in studio in Sherman Oaks on <laughs> Sherman Way next to the 7-Eleven. And I yep. walked to the Mazda dealership with the rest of the money in cash and said, what car can I get for this much? <laughs> 
I'm sure that was like a feeding frenzy, you know, <laughs> and I ended up getting a car with no air conditioning in Los Angeles <laughs> and with a stick shift that I didn't know how to drive. So there you go. <laughs> That's amazing. That's sad, isn't it? Um, no, I think it's awesome. I mean, I'm a stick shift driver, so I love it. Um, so I, I want to, before we kind of, you know, go on to where your career went, I do want to ask, you know, um, did you know you were gay? Yes. Early on? Yes. I knew I was, I, I, it, you know, it coincides right with my mother's death because I was 10. I didn't have my period yet. I wasn't mm -hmm. sexually anything. I was the little girl still. I was 10 years old. And, you know, um, but I do remember I met Lori Shackner that, that year. She came to our school mm -hmm. from, and she had a sister who was three years older who I just, I went into her house to, to say hello, to meet them when they, and Lisa Shackner kissed me on both cheeks. And she looked <laughs> like Barbara Streisand from the main event. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in love. Like I, mm. I knew even like in fifth grade when everybody was, you know, matching up to be boyfriend and girlfriend. And I really always loved Bobby, Sher Bobby uh, Sheeran, but he was dating Lori Shackner. So uh, I dated this boy, you know, fifth grade dated. What did you do? You, you know, traded baseball cards. But Robert DeShulo. But, but I knew, I think, from the time I was 10 that I was gay. You know, mm. I was very good at sports. I was really um, athletic. I was really outspoken when my two older brothers were very shy. And, you know, I would always, uh, I would have to get in fights for them. You know, they weren't mm. kind of tough guys. They were you know, wonderful boys who were not very athletic. And here I was, the sister who could play every sport and, you know, yell and scream and run and dive and catch the ball. And, and um, you know, it was a lot for them. You know, the, the, the coaches used to say, can we trade in the two kids for the boys, for the girl, you know, <laughs> and which is, you don't want to hear when you're 12 and 13, right? Right. Well, and, and also it's, it's funny, the things that you mentioned, um, you know, I, I'm I'm 47, so I'm 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 younger than you. I'm 61. But like, yes, just right. Like I, just in that, I feel like I was part of more of your generation of understanding sexuality and gender than I often feel like I'm part of the culture right now. Right. So the the things that you named in our generation were often indicators of I have a different sexual identity. Yes. Whereas now people might say like, well, there are girls who are terrible at sports and they can be just as much of a lesbian. But in the world that you grew up in, and, and honestly, you know, my uh, the way that I was raised, I think feels a lot more like the way you were raised. Right. There was this notion of sexuality and gender identity, which often went together. It's not always, but I'm curious if at the time you know, there was this notion of like, there's a name for this, there's an identity because, you know, the, the LGBTQ movement uh, was, was very different. It was really emerging from shadows. It was in emerging our and it was very much a separatist community at that time. We weren't mm -hmm. yet, you know, through the AIDS crisis where lesbians and men really did come together out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And we were taking care of the guys who were dying. And we were yeah. getting their medicine and going to act up and laying down and get arrested on the streets. You know, the, yep. th that that horrible time for all gay people when, you know, your whole world, all of your friends are dying, unified the gay community in a way that I mm. think spawned this new generation of, but it's my children even my 10-year-old who corrects me on these things. <laughs> That's right. And it's so embarrassing and it's so <laughs> shaming that I'm this lesbian, big star, <laughs> icon, gay something. And my little 10-year-old is going, you know, mom, there are some kids in my class who don't really know their gender. And I said, well, how could they not know their gender, honey? They go to the bathroom. They're a boy or a girl. <laughs> Mommy, that is not your gender. That's your sex. Your gender is who you think you are. <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right, well, what are we doing? You know, and then she told me, she told me a long time ago at Christmas, she told me that her stuffed animals were non-binary. <laughs> I'm like, here we go. Here we go. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? She goes, they don't feel like a boy and they don't feel like a girl. I said, well, that's fantastic. Do you know what's funny is that I'm a girl 
who people used to call a tomboy because I liked all the boy stuff when I was little. And you know what's weird? Mm. I still do really like the boy stuff. I like football. I like riding a motorcycle. I like to do a lot of stuff that boys traditionally like to do. But you know what else? Never was confused about thinking if I was a boy or a girl. <laughs> Always knew I was a girl and loved being a girl. So you can be a girl and feel any way you want, or you can figure out what it what it is. And I'm like rambling and rambling. And she said, are you done? Are you done? I said, yes, I'm done. You know, I don't know what to do. It's, I was on the set of The L Word and this gorgeous African-American, 20-something, long braids, woman walks by oh my God, Rosie, you have children. Yes, I do. I have five. Oh my God, I can't wait till I'm a dad. I said, oh, yes, because parenting is fun. You know, I didn't know what to say. I'm 61, you know? <laughs> and I always feel like when people write me and say, you know, my father doesn't accept this. Okay, how long did it take you to figure it out? Right. Give your father a couple of months, you know what I mean? <laughs> So sorry, that's a very, um, it's a very appropriate distinction. Mind Balance Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. You've been stewing about a health problem you have. You almost resort to texting your group chat to just get your random friend's opinions. And while you're extremely unlikely to find quality medical advice that way, you can find it from a doctor on ZocDoc. Thousands of medical professionals on ZocDoc are there to help you. They listen like a friend, but give you the expert care that you need. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and available when you need them and treat almost every condition under the sun. No more doctor roulette or scouring the internet and hoping to find reviews that are likely questionable. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor that you haven't even met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who's patient-reviewed and fits their needs and schedule just right. Go to ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash breakdown. ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. You formally came out, which you shouldn't, you know, kind of, have to do. And then also you were already so much in the public eye. Yeah, it was um, a but strange I'm, time, you know, nobody right. would ask you in an interview. It wasn't like it is right. today. Like you have to, when I tell people there was one writer, Patrick Pachenko, who just wrote Pachenko, Pechka, whatever, but it's with a P. He uh, just wrote a book for Cheetah Rivera, a memoir. He wrote her memoir with her and it's beautiful. And he was a very young, you know, writer and he was doing an issue for Cosmo with me on the cover or something weird. I don't even know. It was very early on in my career. And he said, are you dating anyone? And I said, not at the moment. And he said, who could apply? And I said, all, all who want to could apply. And he said, mm -hmm. well, would you prevent accepting um, applications from women? I said, no, I would not. Well, my mm -hmm. publicist at the time, who was the legendary Lois Smith, who started PMK with Pat Kingsley, mm -hmm. who was Marilyn Monroe's publicist, she called Helen Gurley Brown and said, take that out. And they did. Mm -hmm. And it never was heard again. No one ever asked me in an interview, are you gay? I would sit next to Kelly at the awards, get up, hand her my bag and go, you know. I, mm -hmm. I It wasn't like a secret and... But at the time, it was never mentioned by anyone. Your decision to sort of be out and to, to live as an out person, um, it, it was also kind of part of the decision to sort of form this family, correct? Well, you when you first come out, no matter who you are, is when you have a child. Because you go to the doctor and the, you were the parents, you and your partner, or, you know, I did it with, with I adopted two children, then I met Kelly. And so, you mm -hmm. know, from the time that Parker was three, he knew her and he was, that was our family. But the decision to actually come out publicly was because we had had a foster child for two mm -hmm. years and then we're told that we couldn't adopt her because there was a law in Florida that prevented gay people from adopting even the foster children they raised. And there was a lawsuit by two gay men, Loft and Cruteau, and they were AIDS nurses who mm. took the orphaned babies and raised them. And they zero converted a few of them. And they were not allowed to adopt the children that they raised. So I joined their lawsuit with the ACLU. Mm. 
and uh, came out through that lawsuit. Now, it was three months after 9-11, so nobody gave a shit, you know, which mm-hmm. they shouldn't anyway, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, the case was worthy. But at the time, the world was upside down, you know. Sure. Um, but, you know, kind of 9-11 aside, um, I mean, I, I do want to draw significant attention to the level of not just bravery, but absolute commitment and the ability to kind of harness the nonsensical, absurd, inane horrendousness of that time mm. and and how how you made the decision to say, I'm going to. I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm going to be public about it and I'm going to be the essentially the public face yes. of really a, a an entire consciousness shift. And you know, I think especially for for people who either may not remember or or did not know or were, you know, possibly too young to know, the this notion is I- exactly the kind of issue that really was at the forefront of what it means to be a gay person. Yes. The 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 uh, the right to have autonomy, like to even that you even had to fight to say I can be a parent. I mean, that was a You had to lie. Right. I had to lie to become a parent. Hmm. I had to say on my uh, adoption certificate thing that I was not now nor had I ever been a lesbian. Hmm. And gay people who adopted at the time when I did, my oldest son is 27. Uh, that was just standard practice. And there were gay social workers who would, you would know someone who knew someone and you'd call them and they'd get in to be your person. Mm. And we'd help each other create these families. And, you know, we'd get our fingerprints. We'd do everything legally. But as for, you know, who I wanted to be in bed with, I didn't really, you know, wasn't going to let that prevent me from being a parent of children in need. The process by which you became a parent and also kind of simultaneously became an activist, what was that like in terms of sort of the emotional, you know, the emotional ups and downs? Well, you know, I've always kind of been a, a, a loud mouth speaker to what I perceive to be injustice, you know, and uh, that was learned in my kitchen table. I think, you know, my mother was very much into uh, helping the poor and St. Vincent de Paul and, you know, what, what you do in order to be a spiritual person, how you help your neighbor. And, and um, you know, I came by it honestly. So when things would upset me, I would want to talk about them or remedy them or remedy them or try to somehow uh, use whatever power my fame harnessed. And, and, you know, what you perceive that to be before you get there and then what it actually is versus what other people perceive it to be is a, a wide, wide uh, abyss that it's hard to traverse. You know, you just go, that's too big a jump, maybe. But um, I I knew when we could not adopt the foster child that we raised and when I heard the story of of the Lofton Cruteau family, I knew what mm. God was saying to me, you're up, kid. You know, I felt like I'd been on the bench and I'd been supportive of, you know, my gay brothers and sisters. And, you know, and now here was a time where God was saying there's all these kids that need families and you are doing it and um, you got to bring attention to this. And I said, OK. Like, I never could think of doing it just for me. Not that anyone mm-hmm. else's way is a wrong way. Just I knew for me um, it wasn't the hardest thing I ever got through in my life being gay. There were much harder things. My mother dying, the stuff with my father, the chaos in our family, the generational trauma being passed down. You know, there were so many other things that I, you know, I felt needed an adult voice. Like if you're a kid who's being abused, Mm -hmm. chances are the adults who's abusing you aren't going to take you to report it. But the kids that were once those, the adults that were once those children will be the one sticking out for you, you know? You mentioned God, and and I, I hadn't asked about, you know, kind of the religious climate of your family. Mm. I mean, obviously, you you mentioned, you know, being Irish Catholic. Um, did you have a God, kind of a God of your understanding for for all of your young life? Was that a challenge when when your mom died? Like, was there any specific? 
I mean, not that you had to have God speaking to you all the time, but since you mentioned it, I'm, I'm curious what your kind of God consciousness was. I think at the time, I was very uh, black and white Irish Catholic, you know, Jesus on the cross for your <laughs> sins. You better shut up. You never did anything as good as that. And, you know, uh, you better go tell your sins to the guys in the robes. And, you know, I, I think that and I was angry at God. I know that my father was, we went to church one week after my mother died. And you know how they say, for those who have gone to their rest in the hopes of rising again, our dearly departed Roseanne O'Donnell and my siblings started all crying. And my mm. father like bustled us out of the, the church and it was a big to do like, and then we never went back to church again. But I think my quest for spirituality has always been pretty intense. Like I, I was went through reading every book on every kind of religion. I uh, studied the Kabbalah with uh, friends of mine for about five mm -hmm. years and really kind of loved it. I studied with another rabbi friend of mine, um, just the Old Testament, so I could just have more knowledge than I did ever, mm -hmm. you know. And It's I, a pretty good book. Yeah, it's a good book. It's got some <laughs> nice stories in there, <laughs> things I didn't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I really I really think that organized religion is probably going to end us in some way. But the traditions of spiritual truth and um, passing that down to your children is important to me. You know, a lot of your a lot of your persona, you know, as a comedian and as a host, you have always been, as you said, outspoken, and you know, you have a very distinctive voice. Did you ever feel like that was linked to your gayness? Meaning, did you feel you got either more allowance or more criticism? Or how did that figure? Or was it just like, this is me being me and yeah, it doesn't really matter it didn't and really who cares? Figure, although when I did Star Search in 84, Sam Riddle, who has since passed away, the producer, was an old kind of show busy guy and he had worked with all the great Sammy Davis. And he said to me, oh, you're way too tough. And I knew that that meant too gay. And you're never going to mm. make it. But I think part of the thing was, you know, the gay part was secondary. And, you know, like it, it, um, it was so in, inside of me that I didn't question it really. And I just kind mm. of lived it. Like I knew that I didn't want to wear a dress as a kid. So I wouldn't, you know, and, but I didn't kind of have to fight for it because we didn't have a mother. There was any clothes mm -hmm. that you could get a kid that was clean to wear and, you know, nobody was really taking care of us like a mother takes care of little girls, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, my sister is 10 months younger than me and she is not gay at all. And she <laughs> had the same exact <laughs> genes and experiences and grew up in the bed next to me in that house. So, you know, there were there's a lot of reasons that to think and to know for me that it's genetic that you don't you know nobody i don't think wakes up and says oh let's be gay it sounds like it's fun you know although kids today are much different <laughs> my my 20 year old at school I'm, I'm like is that girl gay she goes mom nobody even says that anymore no they don't even it's, we don't and and also my children point out that i shouldn't even be thinking it yeah. they can tell that i'm yes, thinking exactly. things exactly wondering and that i'm a bad person for even thinking about it in my head. Right. My, my kid says to me, you're judging. You're judging right now. I'm like, I'm just curious. I don't follow the whole thing. It's a little confusing for me. You know, Vivi's like, you're going to be over the moon. Because, you know, Dakota now, after she told me that her stuffed animals were non-binary, she told me at Legoland two weeks ago that she is non-binary. And then mm -hmm. she made a non-binary flag on a button and wore the button to school. I was like... Okay. And then I said, she came home and said, how to go with the button? Oh, it was great. Did people know what it was? Yeah, a few people. It's okay, mom. There's a couple non-binaries. Don't worry. I'm like, I'm not worried, honey. I'm fine with this. I'm totally fine. I'm a lesbian icon. <laughs> I totally can deal with this, honey. No problem. I guess. Sorry. That's amazing. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about... Um, you know, there's a lot of ways, obviously, to become a parent, or I hope it's okay to call you a mother. Yes, it is. I'm just old-fashioned I know, like exactly. <laughs> I'm all for mother. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, obviously, we, we never know what we're going to get, whether we birth our kids, whether they're made of our DNA and a person that we know. Like, there's a million ways, and even more now than there used to be. Um, I guess... 
what have you what have you sort of learned about nature and nurture? Like you've had so many different kinds of experiences and some you've had to go through publicly, which I remember when I would see those stories, I always felt like just let Rosie have her life and it's not yeah. anybody's business. But I'm curious, you know, the I don't want to get into sort of like the the drama of it, you know, for for that sake. But but in terms of nature and nurture, I'm I'm sort of curious what how you feel about it. Well, I will say this. There's like a lore about adoption, you know, and um, there are, you know, oh, the heroic parents who take in these children in need and not enough attention is paid to the adoptees in that situation or really to the birth mom. They often get vilified and, and um, you know, I had a, a naive view of adoption, although I was as learned as I could be because I read every book that there was to read and knew a lot about adoption trauma. But there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to be a mother from the time I was a little girl. So I never went through what some of my friends went through, especially the gay friends of not being certain. Oh, no, I was certain from the time I was 10. And, you know, when I knew, uh, you know, that I was gay, a hundred percent, which pretty much was, you know, I dated one boy when I was in my twenties, I think, but, um, short lived, very short lived and, um, <laughs> nice, wonderful man, truthfully. But, uh, I think that nature or nurture is a real question. And when you adopt, you try to find a situation where everyone kind of wins where a family in crisis for a variety of reasons, all of them valid, decide that they can't parent this child and want to find a home for the child. And so you try to make a triad between you, the birth family, and the baby. You know you've signed a triple contract for life that you three are going to be kind of connected in some way, even if it's a closed adoption. All of my adoptions were closed except Dakota because it was 10 years, 20 years later, and the adoption models that is used now mostly is open. And so I had one- Can you explain what closed is yeah, for people who don't know? closed adoption back in the olden days, which is hard to get now, but you can get them, is when the lawyer that you had representing you looked for a family that also wanted no contact with the baby mm -hmm. that until they were 18. And you can have a provision that says at 18, everyone's free to look, which is what we did. You know, uh, mm -hmm. um, we tried to find somebody who wanted a similar thing to what, what I wanted. And what mm -hmm. I wanted was to make sure that the parents' privacy, my privacy, and my mm -hmm. child's privacy were protected. Sure. And um, But when you adopt from all different places in the country or the world, it's like you, you're waiting at the garden for the plant to come up, and you don't know what kind of plant it is. It could be a plant that you've seen in the neighborhood your whole life and you pretty much know how to water and feed and raise that plant. But it could be a plant from a place that you don't even know what, what the rules are to take care of it, that you don't even, that it's such a foreign kind of not natural. That's why when people say, well, it's similar to adoption, I'm like, to giving birth because you don't know what you're going to get when you're giving birth <laughs> either. In a way, it's true. But in another way, you know that you're going to have something similar to you and your husband. You know, you know, you know roughly what the soil is like. Exactly. You know the rough pH. Yes. You got a little window of a pH. Right. You you're going to meet somebody who's a little bit like this little person in your world, and and sometimes you know that doesn't happen. And you know I've had um one my one daughter that one that you were referring to is mm -hmm. you know has a very complicated um, story, but. It's hers to tell. But the end of the story mm -hmm. is she ended up at 17 going back to where she was born hmm. and um, no longer talk, talks to the birth mother there. That was a little bit of her fantasy of what, what was mm -hmm. going to become. And so that didn't necessarily work for her. But I find it unnerving and shocking yet understandable now in some capacity why she did that like she feels the pace of where she is mm -hmm. the kind of people that are there she feels she's akin to like she feels a calling a pulling to her home and her family of origin 
And um, when I think of nurture or nature, sometimes I think love has no say, you know. Because that's your baby. That's like, that's kid. your kid. That's right. That's your kid. That's my kid. That's my kid. And, you know, she's uh, suffering and struggling with different challenges that, um, mm-hmm. you know, I wouldn't really wish on any family. And um, as as you hit 25 and, and, and you don't have your parents to protect you anymore, you're not a child, you um, are out there on your own. And, and sometimes, most times, without a family, that's a terrifying place to be. Mm-hmm. What is adoption trauma? Adoption trauma is the fact that the baby sitting in the amniotic fluid with the cortisol flipping out from the mother who's mm-hmm. going to have to do this thing that she doesn't really want to do, place the baby or wants mm-hmm. to do or needs to do but feels she can't do. It's all of that cortisol stew that the baby's in. And then, you know, hearing the voices of the mother and the father, hearing oh. the voices and the smell, there's actually smells that baby takes from the mom. And then all of a sudden you're in this world and you're given to someone else and they don't smell the same. It's not the same heartbeat rate. And there's an initial primal wound that occurs with these adoption families. That's one of the premises of adoption trauma. Now, my son, Blake, who's 23 and is getting married, you know, thinks it's a load of crap. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, I'm very <laughs> traumatized by that when I was in a diaper, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, he's a New York tough guy, right? You know, he, mm-hmm. I mean, Parker also, I think, does not feel traumatized at all. My two boys don't feel that. And, um, you know, Dakota is on the spectrum and had a beautiful interaction with her birth mother when she was five asked mm-hmm. to talk to her on the phone and we found her and got her on the phone and um, she said, I just wanted to let you know, I'm the baby that was in your stomach. Oh God. And I wanted you to know that I ended up with my mommy because she grabbed my finger and I wouldn't let go of her pinky. So I'm all good now. And I just wanted to tell you, so bye. And she walked away from the phone. The birth mother's sobbing, I'm sobbing, you know, and oh. she never mentioned it again. Not once. But she sometimes says, I have a little sister. I have an older sister. I said, you have two older mm-hmm. sisters. She said, no, my birth mother had a one-year-old at my, at the hospital when I was born. I heard you telling someone that. I said, well, you are right. That is right. Wow. Right. So, you know, she goes, why didn't you ever tell me that? I'm like, I don't know, sweetheart. It wasn't a secret. I just didn't, I didn't know that that was something Mm -hmm. that you would want to know. I would want to know that, mom. I said, okay, sorry, I didn't tell you, you know. There's something about the brutal honesty of autism that is freeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no artifice, you know, you can't. You you have a lot of kids. I love it. what? Yeah, tell me. What, I'm the middle what of five, like? right? I'm the middle of right. five, and it was great. And across the street, Jackie had three, and the Nordens had three, and the Kutches had five. And, you know, all of us, we all grew up in this big, you know, posse of kids our own age playing kickball and kick the can and red light, green light, one, two, three. And it was a, a glorious existence in that capacity. And mm-hmm. I always loved having a lot of siblings. I loved feeling in school, like I had people to take care of me should anything happen, you know? And, um, I wanted a big family. I was, I thought I would have eight to tell you the truth. And I I ended up with five, but, um, and I'm done. I'm pretty sure. But, uh, I see another cute baby on TikTok. I can't promise anything. (laughs) Um, when my, um, when my kids, you know, were, were born when I became a mom, Mm. you know, you have this, um, this very specific feeling that like your existence is different in a way that will never go back no matter what. And, you know, I used to, you know, people talk about like, Oh, my heart is outside of my body, you know? And there's all these like ways that people describe it. And the way I once described it to my kids was it's like being connected by an invisible string Mm. and no matter where they are, I, it's like I, and sometimes it can feel physical, you know, but um, it's like you're always attached. And I remember my my little one, Fred, I uh, was very tender. 
He said, that must be a very long string, Mama. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, it's it's a super long string. And, um, you know, you you had a heart attack. Yes. At a very interesting time in your parenting life. And and I can't help but thinking about, you know, that notion of your heart outside of your body, yes. you know, how it lives, yes. you know, it lives in all your kids. Um, what do you remember of that heart attack? I, you know, I had a radio show at the time and I was doing the radio show and I would walk up the hill like, a, you know, not a big hill, but a, a hill mm -hmm. to get it wouldn't make me a little winded to get up to the hill to the house. And I remember it started being like unbearably difficult. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I was in the shower or in washing my hair and my arms kind of hurt a little. Like I was like, that's so weird. Why do my biceps hurt? Right now, this is like oh. already it's starting and I'm ignoring. I'm ignoring. Is this like days? This is the this is about two or three days. So on okay. a Monday. So I felt this on a Friday. We did the radio show. So then we oh, have Saturday, God. Sunday. So Monday, I go to the hospital with a friend who's doing chemo treatment on the way out. Big, big woman stuck in a car, little car. Her, her hair was falling out from chemo. She had a, a walker. I don't know how she got it out of the car. She gets out of the car and she asked me to help her. And I helped her pull and it took a long time. It took like 25 minutes and we get her out and get her on her walker and mm. get her in the thing. And then my arms are really hurting. And I'm thinking, this is from lifting up that woman. I'm oh so tired. I better go to bed. So I go to bed. <laughs> I fall asleep. I wake up. I'm white as can be. My kids go, mommy, you look like a ghost. I take some baby aspirin. I get Ziploc bags. <laughs> You're still not thinking, maybe I should go to the no, hospital. At this point, I, I type it in. You, you're I go, not thinking about it. Women's heart attack. Oh, I had like eight out of the nine symptoms. But you know what else <laughs> I was thinking? Tyne Daly went to the hospital in Rockland County where I lived in Nyack Hospital mm -hmm. when she was a kid and she had like her appendix exploded and she has a huge star on her, scar on her stomach. So I remember thinking, Tyne Daly told me never to go to that hospital. <laughs> And that's what I was in my deluded state. I kept thinking, Tyne Daly said, you know, Cagney and Lacey said, don't go there. But <laughs> I ended up going two days later on a Wednesday. I get in the doctor's office. I hadn't been before. I say, listen, I helped this woman. And he said, could you stop talking? And he picks up the phone and very gently says something. And he hangs up. And then people are running down the hall. I hear running. Oh and then they're lifting me and putting me and throwing me. You're in the hospital. You're going to the emergency room. You're going to the cath lab. You've had a massive heart attack. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, no, you've had a massive heart attack. I said, I have four kids. Do not let me die. Do not let me die. And uh, this one woman who was so nice, this nurse, I start to cry as they were going to put me under. And she said, look, look at me, look at me. I'm going to be here when you wake up. And when I was awake, she was there. And she ended up being the most lovely nurse that I'm telling you, nurses are the heartbeat of any strong hosp hospital. And their yep. job is to love people back to life. Can you imagine having that be your job? No. no. I mean, I try and make people laugh. Me too. And like, that's hard enough. Yeah. So uh, what did they do when they put they they put your heart back together? Yes, they put in a stent and then they uh, had me lose weight. I went on, I got a vertical gastric sleeve right after I was 50. Mm -hmm. I'm 61 now, so it's been 11 wow. years. And, um, you know, I have to keep my weight in the 190s, which, you know, I'm doing mm -hmm. and uh, have been doing for a little bit, you know. So the, the woman is very happy with my numbers. The cardiologist mm -hmm. is, the doctor is wonderful and you know, she's like, you know, I'm taking that drug Manjaro because I have uh, diabetes and I'm taking the lowest dose, though, because, you know, we're not doing it for weight loss. We're doing it to get these numbers to a certain number and and um, and it's doing it. So right now, I think I don't even technically have diabetes because my A1C right. went from a seven to a six point two. Oh, my gosh. I wanted to also ask you, you know, in terms of your heart. Yes. And the the things that, you know, your your body and your spirit and your, you know, the things that you've been through. Um your ex-wife, um, Michelle, mm. um, she she died by suicide. Yes, she did. And, you know, um, this is one of those things like I couldn't decide. I'm like, I don't really want to ask you about it because it's it's A, not my business. And B, I kind of thought, 
you know, there's so much that that you represent for so many people. Mm -hmm. And there's so many experiences that you've chosen to be so brave about. Yes. And uh, obviously that story is hers, God rest her soul. But I, I wonder if you can sort of speak about, you know, what it's like to be a public person, you know, who is addressing things that are so incredibly personal and also it wasn't your current spouse, you know, but yeah. I, I'm curious, you know, what, I totally what that, like, understand. how do you frame I, that? I, I, I understand. And it's hard because I, I didn't quite know how to frame it because she had moved on and married someone else and had a child mm -hmm. with that other person and she had given up her rights to Dakota. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she got very sick very quickly. Mm -hmm. She had uh, desmoid tumors, which are a gelatinous cancerous mass that was uh, really affecting her ability to live and to consume mm -hmm. food and you know, it was a very difficult time. We were together for a year and then she got cancer. And um, then she got addicted to the pain meds from cancer. Mm -hmm. And I really was not good at noticing that that was happening. Now, mm -hmm. give me an alcoholic anywhere in a room and I can yeah. spot him in five seconds. But I didn't know from pill addiction. I didn't know... Mm -hmm what was happening. I thought this was a reaction to the cancer. She was in some trauma and therapy. And, and then, you know what, she just decided that she wanted to move on with her life. And, and she went and, and that was that. And I hadn't really seen her or talked to mm -hmm. her. And um, then her new wife called and I was on the set of Smilf. And mm -hmm. she told me, I'm Michelle Round's new wife. And I said, oh, um, is she in trouble? Did she try to kill herself again? Because she had tried to kill herself once mm. um, at the end of our relationship. And mm. she said she did try and she succeeded. Oh, God. Yeah. And I was in shock. You know, I was in shock, really. I had had two friends die who were dying of AIDS, who took suicide as a way out with pills and a a peaceful decision that, you know, covered in carpies and really having no other choice. But I never really suffered the suicide of someone close to me. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, stunning. It took my knees out. Like, I didn't quite know mm -hmm. where to put that, you know. In terms of your, your parenting responsibilities also, you know, what, what is that? What was that balance like for you? Well, you know, it was interesting because um, Michelle had been so sick there in the house with the little kids mm -hmm. throwing up and everything and the cancer was back and it was scary and crazy and there was a new baby and there was a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I tried to protect them from it as much as I could. Kelly was helpful and, um, mm -hmm. you know, but that's the first thing you think about, you know, is that this, right? how did I not see? number one. And um, number two, how do I protect their little, their little hearts from the knowledge mm -hmm. that that is a, a sad truth to so many, you know, to too many as an option, you know, once it becomes an option. Well, and, and I think also, you know, I know more about alcoholism than I do about um, this kind of addiction that we're talking about. But, you know, I think also it is so connected to, to pain. And, you know, in many cases to, to physical and chronic pain, uh, but also some of the work that I've been doing just in my own journey um, is also the, you know, this this knowledge that we are now having as more of a mainstream concept that what happens to us mentally impacts the way we also perceive pain, both the way we perceive physical pain and the way we sort of frame all of the pain and and trauma, you know, that that we've experienced. Um, is there anything that sort of in retrospect, you know, now that there's some distance from it, um, is there anything that, you know, that you think about in terms of sort of, I don't know, I guess what alcoholism, what what alcoholism does for pain versus what, you know, these other kind of roots do for pain? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, you know, Chelsea is, is struggles with addiction. And, um, 
you know, came about it honestly. She was born addicted as an infant. Mm. And uh, that is the one I used to beat myself up parent-wise. You know? mm. And I go to meetings and I go to talk to other parents in similar situations. And um, I understand what's going on and it's not about me and it's a mm. disease. And I, I go through it, you know, I do. But um, that's the most difficult thing I've had to endure. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that she understands, you know, I don't think maybe until she's out of it and hopefully she will one day be out of it that, um, you know, she will understand, you know, I got frustrated with her the other night and texted her, you know, I, I pray to God that your kids never go through this, Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, not a kind thing to say, but kind of at the end of my rope going, you know, do you know what's what this does to everyone, you know, Mm, but when you're that deep in it, I don't know that you do. Yeah. Yeah. It has uh, tentacles, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many aspects of your career that we didn't get to touch on and, you know, kind of, um, you know, you had in particular, you know, two separate stints on, on the view, Mm. you know, as part of this kind of like group of women and, um, you know, it put you in a position um, to speak up in ways that were, you know, really powerful and, you know, for those of us who happen to agree with you on a lot of things, very empowering Thank for you those very of much. us. Thank you. <laughs> for those of us watching. Um, but, you know, I wonder, um, you know, when I think about the arc of kind of Roe, you know, and sort of what what started as, you know, when I think of how you described yourself as a kid and and as this kind of like feisty teenager, you know, pulling jokes off of, you know, albums, uh, you know when I think about sort of the view as sort of the other, you know, the other end of that spectrum, this is you as, you know, a woman owning all of yourself, all of your, you know, your, your gender, your sexuality, you know, being very clear about who you are, um, and, and still being in this position to sort of, is that a, was it an episode by episode set of decisions of like, where do I speak up? What do I say? No. Or was it, yeah, tell no, me about how totally that kind of evolved. Just, you know, you want to ask me my opinion on anything? I usually give it, you know, sometimes to the detriment and sometimes. But I I want to talk about things. I want to talk about things. If Bill Cosby is accused of sedating and raping all these women and it's the number one story in the news, I want to talk about that, yes. Hmm. But, you know, things that were happening like war would be happening and and we'd be talking about, you know, some person who had an affair and should the friend have told and you know it mm. I, I don't think it lifted women up in a way that women deserve to be lifted up and I don't think that it was you know it's a show about women and women's point of view and it's run by men <laughs> so mm-hmm. Bill Getty was the producer and he was a right wing Republican and you know he mm. had his agenda and um, he and Elizabeth Hasselbeck would do a little huddle before the show and <laughs> you know read the Republican talking points and then you know get on there but you know listen it's been on a long time and and people enjoy it and and you know I I don't think it was the best use of my time and it's not mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to be a pundit I happen to be you know opinionated and and um, outspoken so I don't worry mm-hmm. about my career when there's something that I believe in. I was on The View. Um, I don't think our paths crossed directly, but I was on The View. Um, I, I wrote a book called Beyond the Sling about my family's experience with attachment parenting. Which I think which is fantastic time, and fascinating. Thank you. But at the time, people thought it was freaky. I had gone yes. bananas, right? And also, I'm, you know, I'm educated as a neuroscientist. I studied child development. Like, you know, this was like literally I was trained to study attachment and oxytocin and and people thought I had lost my ever-loving mind, which the fact is, you know, the notion of everybody gets to parent the way they want to was really not a thing. You right. know, my first son was born. I was 29 years old. It was 2005. Um, but there really was this notion of, like, there's one way to do it, and if it's not whatever the current, you know, sort of Western medicine model is, you're nuts. So whatever. I wrote a book about it. I'm completely aware that there were things in there that people were like, that's crazy, fine. I went on the show and I had a very pleasant time. And um, what I know to be true is that when I got divorced from my husband, we were together a total of, how long was I together? 15 years we were together mm-hmm. and we were married for nine. Um, 
what what I was told was that there was a discussion about it, you know, as they do. And someone said, that's that's what you get. That's what you get for parenting that way. A divorce and I remember is what you it, get? It, it, right. Oh, yeah. I wonder Meaning who like, that well, was. if you if you let your kid, you know, sleep in your bed, like if you you know, gotta gotta give him the vagina yeah, if he doesn't have on. the full access. Right, exactly. And at the time I was like, that's astounding and it's disappointing. And I remember though it it hurt me very deeply also as a feminist. It hurt me as a woman who made a decision to parent according to my instinct and what I believed was scientifically, you know, and psychologically appropriate. And that notion, you know, that a group of women would discuss that, it just, it felt so, it felt so strange to me. Mm. And um, it's really interesting though, because when I compare, you know, my kid is 17 now, and when I see the way we interact and the way they interact with their dad, you know, and and w- what even a divorced family can look like, that it's still a family, you know? And when I think about it, it's like, wow, I wish I had the confidence I have now, right? I needed then. And so when you talk about kind of your experience, I, I it's different because it wasn't you being, let's say, attacked because you breastfed or whatever. Right, right. Um, but that notion that it feels like you have so much more security now, you know, in that decision. And I wonder, you know, as you see what the political climate is like now, what feels most important to you? Like if you were to be in that position, and obviously with your podcast, that might be part of what you do. But, you know, for me as as a woman, as a feminist, as a liberal, you know, there's things that I feel are most important. If you had to name like three things that you feel would be most important in that kind of arena to talk about, what would they be? Women's rights, abortion, number one, Mm -hmm. I think. Um, because when why is that important? Because when yeah, women it a little when bit. women's rights are imposed upon, and when we're taken away, and our equality is lessened, and the whole family suffers from women not getting paid enough money to women mm-hmm. who uh, don't who are getting sexually exploited in work, like the, mm-hmm. the women's rights and and fe- I, I'm a feminist. I am a diehard feminist. I will always mm-hmm. be a feminist. I um don't think that puts me in a box. It puts me in, in my opinion, the a, a, a house with open doors for other women to come in and be safe mm-hmm. and have a place where we are each other's sisters and mothers and daughters. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, to me, the, the most vital part right now. The, the second mm-hmm. thing would be um, racism in America, anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it is startling to put on your TikTok. And I think this is part of the reason they're trying to ban TikTok. <laughs> and you can see, you know, black people being nearly killed by police officers. You can see, you know, these horrible people screaming at at at, at people of color or Jews or Chinese people. You know, it it, it the the way that we're going towards fascism. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyone who studied history needs to be terrified and every woman huh. needs to know that they have to vote in their own interest to save themselves and their children. And mm-hmm. I, I hope to God it, it happens. Um, those two issues, human rights, uh, which is, you know, women's rights, children's rights, gay rights, mm-hmm. LGBTQ rights, trans rights, um, you know, so vital. And we have to really watch who they are targeting. And right now mm-hmm. it feels like it's trans people. They're targeting trans people as the ones yep. that are causing all the distress. It was the gays when they wanted to get married, right? But that's right. Yeah, now it's the trans people who, you know, want to put on a little drag show. It's it's um, terrifying to me politically what's happening. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think I mean I we don't even need a a third cuz those two are so good, but I also do just want to give a nod because again, I I do feel very very close to the generation of, of feminists that you are. And I like to remind people that, you know, the definition of feminism, that sort of old school academic, you know, we call ourselves second wave feminists. Um, you know, the notion was that we are not just fighting for women's rights. We're fighting for human rights. Yes. And the notion was that women have some sort of innate or intuitive or instinctual notion that the rights of people of all races, class, classes and genders need to be cared for. 
And that, you know, is so much for me at the forefront of the activism that I that I do choose to do. Um, there's so many important aspects of third wave feminism. I think there's fourth wave now. God bless them. Um, but but I really appreciate you highlighting, again, some of those old school um, traditions yes. of, you know, the, the women whose shoulders we stand on. Right. And, and to look, you know, when I look at the women who made me go, holy shit, Ann Richards, look what Ann Richards did, you know, look yeah. at Shirley Chisholm, look at these mm -hmm. Bella Abzug, look at these women yep. who refuse to shut up. And if you're a woman <laughs> who has access to a microphone, use it, you know, use it. Well, what what a fantastic way to end our time together, because I am so grateful that you came and sat at a microphone with me. Um, I respect you greatly, and I happen to agree with you on everything. But even if I didn't, I still respect and you. And I remember when you came out with that book, and I thought it was so amazing. I kind of did that myself without it having yeah. be a, a name. Yep. I didn't have the name for it, but that That's kid, right. those kids were in Baby Bjorns for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing that I love more than than that. And, you know, my 10-year-old still sleeps with me every night. And, wow. you know, she's the, the doctors, we talk about it. And with her talking doctor and my talking doctor. And, you know, mm -hmm. they say when she's 16, she's not going to want to do it. So just, That's you know, right. ride well, it out. I so Go figure. I support your right as a mother to make decisions that are appropriate for your family. Thank you so much. And I support your right to do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thank for being you. You're here. Delicious. I wish you all I, the best. I oh, admire you so you. much and I admire your brain and I love you on Jeopardy. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so much. We're a, we're a nightly Jeopardy watcher. Wonderful. Well, I will think of you when I'm uh, up there in my, my snazzy blazer. All right, I will. Um, thank you so much for being part of our breakdown. And um, yeah, thank you so much. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One and now she's gonna break down